What do you believe about the existence of spirits? What do you believe about the existence of an omnipotent power that rules the entire world? What do you believe about the importance of your own ancestors? What do you believe concerning the importance of nature cycles and the patterns of life? What do you believe concerning divination, that is, seeking to foresee or foretell future events and discover hidden knowledge, usually by interpretation of omens or by the aid of supernatural powers? Well, regardless of how you answered these questions, this is a good place to begin our study of the Eastern religions, Taoism, Confucianism, and Shintoism. And today we will be focusing on Taoism. All of these religions believe strongly in the things that I just listed in the series of questions at the beginning of this lecture. And it's important for us to realize that if we hope to understand a little better what the philosophies are and the religious faith means in each of these religions. Now, all three religions are closely associated. There are blended systems, three systems of blended belief, Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. All three arise from traditional beliefs, either in China or in Japan. And of course, in Japan, uh, traditional Chinese beliefs became synthesized with traditional Japanese beliefs over time. One of the traditional beliefs is, this, is about the spirits. Spirits of nature and human life, of life stages and cycles. These spirits may be benevolent and helpful, or malevolent and harmful. Maintaining harmony is the goal in all of these religions, and that goal is to be achieved through rituals and sacrifice. The Shang Dynasty, Tian, 1500 to 1100 BC, is a beginning point to start talking about Taoism. It, there was the belief that Tian was an omnipotent power that ruled the entire world. It was also called Shangdi and viewed as a personal deity. The Zhu or Chu dynasty replaced Shangdi with an impersonal divine force or realm. And this occurred between the years roughly 1100 BC and around 250 BC. During this time, there was a great generation of ancestors, or I'm sorry, a great veneration of ancestors. Ancestor uh, veneration almost corresponds to the idea of ancestral worship that you find in the Near East and some of the other lectures I've talked to you about uh, where they would have the uh, rituals to bring back the ancestors from the dead along with the uh, fallen angel watchers. Uh, and this is a similar kind of an idea. There was also a great emphasis upon nature, the natural order of things, and the rhythms of life. The symbol for this came to be the uh, yang and yin, which you have all seen. The circle that has uh, is divided in half with a curved line. One side is white, one side is black. And uh, one side represents the feminine aspect, the other side the masculine aspect. And uh, there is a small dot of the opposing color inside each of the, of the sides, which represents uh, the other or the opposite influence embedded in that. So you have a dot representing the feminine inside the masculine and a dot representing the masculine inside the feminine. Uh, divination was, is practiced through what's called the I Ching or I Ching, which you may have heard of, and the reading of the hexagram. Now, the hexagram we think of in the West is a six-pointed star, but that's not what is meant in Taoism by the hexagram. And I'll try to show you some uh, visuals as we go along to help you understand what that's like. So where does Taoism begin? Well, as near as we can understand, it begins roughly at the same time as uh, Buddhism and Hinduism and Jainism began, 5600 BCE. Of course, we have no uh, credible authoritative records or evidence that this is the case. Once again, all of the material comes from quite a bit later, 300 years 
later, for example. The earliest uh, scraps of manuscripts begin to appear. But Taoism is founded on one person and his life and his teachings, and his name was Lao Tzu. And uh, his life is, is really kind of a mystery. It's shrouded in uncertainty, mystery, myth, and legends. But supposedly he composed the text that became the uh, guiding you know, set of teachings and beliefs for Taoism, and it's called the Tao Te Ching. It's a collection of spiritual writings. Now, there are a few ancient manuscripts and fragments that go back to around 300 BCE, so we're a little closer here, certainly, than we are with the sayings of Buddha or the ancient Hindu writings uh, or uh, the writings of uh, Mahavira and Jainism. So our time gap is not quite so pronounced. The content of the Tao Te Ching is intentionally ambiguous and vague. Ambig ambiguity, of course, meaning an uncertainty about what's really meant in terms of what something is, but vagueness and uncertainty in terms of how much is meant about something. So that intentional ambiguity and vagueness serves to challenge the devotee or, or the practitioner of Taoism to find his own path. The Tao Te Ching may have originally been written as a ruler's handbook or a spiritual guidebook. Uh, the Tao, which means the way, uh, is the focus or the center, the core of Taoism and what is being presented in the Tao Te Ching. And uh, the Tao is described as an inscrutable and indiscernible mystery. It cannot be understood, it can only be experienced. It uh, cannot be named, cannot be fully described, and of course can't be understood. It is not God, but it's an impersonal force. If you think of Star Wars, like the, uh, the may the force be with you, that's like the Tao. Everything in the world is a manifestation of the Tao in some sense. Experiencing the Tao requires a rejection of all desires, for individual things. And this is much like Buddhism. And of course, uh, Buddhism and uh, Siddhartha Gautama's uh, Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism really emphasize this idea of extinguishing the candle of desire to eliminate suffering. And this form of Buddhism made its way up into China and became uh, quite an influential and synthesized with the Tao to form what we call now Taoism. Anyway, the rejection of all desires and individual things is a part of the Tao, and the Tao may only be experienced intuitively. You remember I've talked about the four methodologies for decision-making. Uh, majority rule, uh, nature and nurture, genetics and socialization, and uh, external objective revelation, and then, of course, personal intuition. Well, personal intuition is the method that Taoism promotes. Okay, so uh, the Shangji or Changzu, which appeared around 300 BC, contains seven what are called inner chapters, which are viewed as authentic and attributed to Zhuang, uh, and 26 outer chapters, which are compilations from other authors and added later. The emphasis is a need for harmony and simplicity, but it also includes an effective use of humor and whimsy. So humor and whimsy is a tool that's incorporated into uh, these writings to make the point more effective and in some ways uh, more accessible and palatable. Emphasis, emphasis uh, in this way also involves a rejection of all barriers or divisions emphasizing the whole over the disparate parts. And this is where you have the yang and the yin. It's the whole, not one side or the other, but it is the union of the two opposites. So, uh, the Tao we mentioned, let, let me run through a few of these terms. 
and emphases again for you. The Tao we mentioned means pattern, process, or nature, or the way. Uh, there's also a concept called Wu Wei, W-U, and then W-E-I. The ideal here is for effortlessness. That is, entering the flow of being and the flow of nature and accepting the rhythms and the patterns of both. So it's not to fight and struggle against natural things, but to blend and harmonize with those natural things. And that's Wu Wei. The I Ching is the ancient text presenting ideas about how to keep human behavior in accordance with the alternating cycles of nature. And we'll talk about those a little more here in just a while. Um, of course, nature is very important in Taoism, and as such, uh, we see an emphasis upon naturaliz naturalism and natural things uh, in terms of emphasizing isolation and solitude where one communes with nature. Uh, alongside this is the view that society and human institutions actually become a barrier to the balance and the harmony of one's being, one's spirit, with the natural world and the natural elements. So, of course, Taoism would reject the idea of socialization or conditioning because that becomes a barrier to just experiencing intuitively the flow of life and the flow of the Tao. Introspection is very important. While one is immersed in nature and harmonizing oneself with nature, an important aspect of this is looking inward to discover the Tao within oneself. That is the pattern or the way or the flow inside oneself. Uh, alongside that the, is the belief in simplicity so that uh, it's, it, the, the view is it's easier to experience the Tao and harmonize one's life with the Tao if things are made simple. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, in his classic book called Walden, where he went back to the woods and back to nature to simplify his life, has that great statement where he says, simplify, simplify, simplify. And this was his attempt um, to harmonize his life with natural elements and the flow of natural things. So introspection becomes an important way to do that, the Tao within, and simplicity is a way of helping with that. So there's a rejection of complex and artificial things. For example, formal higher education. In the Tao, uh, the Tao Te Ching would say to you that spending time formally in a class you pay for for college is not going to really be beneficial to you in harmonizing your inner Tao with the outer Tao of the world and nature. Spontaneity is also emphasized. But spontaneity is not to be understood as impulsiveness. In uh, Taoism, spontaneity is the action of true no-mind wisdom. Now, I know that sounds a little strange. Remember what I said about intentional ambiguity and intentional uncertainty. But the point is acting in the moment. And in order to do this, one must control the moment by being well ahead of it. This is anticipation. Now, this seems strange because anticipation seems to be the uh, counter to spontaneity. But you are uh, engaging in a sort of planned spontaneity, if you will. I know this seems paradoxical, but that's the idea. The point is never reacting or planning the next move, uh, never retaliating or attacking, but always, as the Tao puts it, bubbling up or fermenting in a world of constant, uh, timeless flow, of timeless flow, the now. It's very existential. So the spontaneity is responding in the moment, but the anticipation is preparing oneself through introspection, through simplicity, for those moments, and then responding in the now with that uh, inner Tao. Relativity is also an important idea, but we're not talking about the relativity of uh, uh, Albert Einstein's mathematics and, and, and physics. Relativity here means that the individual perspective in the world is very limited. And that is, the appearances of things 
are not the, the true reality of the whole thing. So the world is viewed as in a state of constant flux, constant change, and our perceptions change along with it. Okay? So there are in Taoism three what they refer to as treasures or keys to good and healthy life. And we've seen this in a lot of these uh, religious perspectives. There seems to be a, an emphasis upon three primary things. Uh, but in Taoism, those three things are compassion, humility, and moderation. And those are pretty good principles. Uh, I, I think that most people, if they really emphasize compassion, humility, and moderation, not only uh, have lives that are more content and more at peace, but I think they also contribute to the same thing in the lives of others. So those aren't bad concepts or principles. So um, let me talk to you a little bit about basic teachings of Taoism, and we'll, we'll as we do this, we'll look at the, some of the cycles of nature and life, and we'll also look at uh, the... Uh, Yi Ching and the hexagram as ways of trying to discern life and where it's going. There is in Taoism a concept called Wu Ching, and Wu Ching refers to the five phases of Taoism, which are five states of nature. The fivefold conceptual scheme that many Chinese fields used to explain a wide array of phenomena. This is even used in Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine, these five phases of Taoism. And let me uh, share a little bit about, about what their main focus is and then some of the specifics about these phases. Uh, everything from cosmic cycles of the universe to the interaction between your own bodily internal organs uh, to looking at the succession of political regimes and social conflict and change. All of these things are part of the five phases of Taoism, including, as I said, natural medicine or the properties of medicinal drugs and medicinal treatments. The order of presentation is known as mutual generation. In the order of mutual overcoming, these five elements are described in nature as wood, earth, water, fire, and metal. And of course, this is a little bit like our, our uh, view of, of five elements in the West. These natural things that are viewed uh, as, as descriptive of the basic elements of nature, but in Taoism are also descriptive of the cycles of nature, the seasonal changes of uh, human cycles, bodily functions, and uh, rites of passage in life. So these five phases of Taoism really permeate everything in life. Now, the first, wood, is uh, corresponds with the, the season spring. It lasts 72 days, and the emphasis there is a period of growth which generates abundant wood and vitality for the new year. Um, you can probably you know, figure out how this corresponds to you and your life, the beginning of your life and growing and developing and becoming mature. The second phase is fire, and this takes place during summer, and it's also 72 days long. It's a period of swelling, flowering, brimming, and is very powerful. Fire and energy are emphases here. Uh, third is earth. It's also 72 days. But I need to emphasize it's a little different. While we have wood and fire, spring and summer, following one after the other for 72 days, earth is 72 two days long, but it's four different segments. Each segment, 18 days long. And uh, this represents... The earth represents transitional times between the other four phases. Okay, so those transitional, transitional times, uh, for example, there's an 18-day period that comes between wood and fire, spring and summer. Anyway, 
the in-between transitional periods of Earth are a are separate seasons known as late summer or long summer. Uh, the latter case associated with leveling and dampening, that is moderation and fruition, where things become to uh, become. Uh, I'm sorry, where things come to ripeness. Then we have uh, metal, our fourth phase, which is also 72 days and corresponds with what we think of as autumn. It's a period of harvesting and collecting and gathering and preparing for what comes next, which is water and winter, also 72 days long. It's a period of retreat where stillness and storage pervades, where contemplation and introspection become possible, and then the anticipation of the repetition of the phases with the coming spring. Uh, of course, along with this idea of the phases, there is the concept of cycles. But while we have five phases, there really are two cycles. The five phases describe two cycles uh, that incorporate the phases. The first cycle is a generation generating, I'm sorry, a generating or creation cycle. It also is sometimes referenced as mother son and uh, this would make sense because of course the child is conceived and then developed in the womb and then the mother gives birth and you have new life. So uh, this first cycle is the generating or creation cycle. This is uh, followed by the overcoming or destruction cycle and it's known as the grandfather grandson. Well of course after the child is born, I remember my oldest child spent a lot of time with his grandfather when he was just from the time he was a baby and a toddler up, and his grandfather served to teach him so many things about life and how to do things that uh, I understand a little bit, I think, about why grandfather, grandson would be the, the uh, identifier for this overcoming and destruction cycle. And overcoming and destruction might need to be understood as not just destroying as in uh, anarchy and chaos, but as in changing the form of things for useful purposes. Okay? Well, within Chinese medicine, the effects of these two main relationships or cycles uh, is further elaborated in these ways. One is inter-promoting, which is mother-son, then interacting, grandmother-grandson, and then overacting, which is the key cycle, and counteracting, which is the reversal key cycle. Uh, in terms of generating, here's a way to kind of understand it. This is the uh, what, what Taoism calls the memory jogs to help people understand these phases and how they work together. Um, wood feeds fire. That is, fire consumes wood. And uh, this produces energy, heat, power. But then fire creates earth, that is, in the sense of the wood burns and becomes ash and goes back into the earth. The earth then, over time, produces metal, as the elements of the earth are, are compressed and, and formed and fashioned into uh, harder substances. And then the metal collects water. The metal is capable of holding water and, and determining its shape and form. And then finally, the water nourishes wood, and you have the complete cycle, the generating cycle. The overcoming cycle uh, might be understood as controlling, restraining forces. The generating cycle, of course, begetting or engendering forces. But the overcoming cycle, as control or restraint, works this way. The wood can part the earth, such as roots of trees growing down, or roots of trees uh, forming a system that prevents a soil erosion. The earth dams uh, or uh, absorbs water. The water then can, can extinguish fire. The fire can melt metal if it's hot enough, and the metal can be forged and fashioned to chop wood and use the wood then for other constructive purposes. So the generating overcoming cycles work together to show how the five phases operate in tandem with one another 
and uh, how they connect with our own lives, with human lives and human energies and functions. And uh, of course, all of this is about creating a harmony in the Tao or with the Tao. Vegetarianism is also very important in Taoism. The belief is that this dietary practice is designed to promote health and longevity, but also a respect for all other, lo of all other life. The uh, key is considered the life force that indwells all things. You remember there's the idea of soul in uh, Jainism, jiva, which is uh, a part of all things. Everything has a jiva, a soul. Well, it's a similar idea. Only here we have it as a life force, not, not soul. Uh, there's also the concept of xing, which is sexual energy, appropriated during ritual sex magic. And I know here we are again, but this is a practice. And the ritual sex magic is designed to enhance the key and the release of spiritual energy. And I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, when I get back to class for the next class session. The yin-yang, the union of opposites, produces powerful energy flows, especially through nature and ritual sex magic. Uh, this is referred to as the joining energy. And of course, the yin and the yang are the uh, masculine feminine aspects of all things, but in particular of, of human life and relationships. Uh, social and political involvement is interesting in Taoism because the belief is that uh, uh, you know social institutions are not really that helpful in enabling someone to understand himself and become harmonized or in tune with the flow of the Tao. So there's a laissez-faire attitude like uh, uh, just keep your hands off it and whatever those people want to do, they can do, but they don't really understand the importance of the Tao and how it works. Um, anarchy, pluralism, rejection of conventional morality can all, all become issues because the Tao approach to life is so individualistic uh, that there's not a social kind of a restraint or control over what people are doing or how they're doing it. Taoism, uh, after developing initially, 300-600 BC roughly, grew and uh, spread until around the 13th century CE. Around thirteen hundred, or around twelve hundred, uh, and then it began to wane. Of course, you have another major religious viewpoint that arose uh, in Confucianism that we're going to look at next time. Taoism was suppressed in the twentieth century by the modern Chinese government because they viewed Taoism as a competing force in society. Uh, of course, the communist Chinese government is very much about control, about educating people, about telling people, uh, conditioning people in terms of how they should view life and how they should behave, how sh they should view themselves. And uh, Taoism is so individual, this runs counter to the goals of a regime like the communist Chinese government. So it was suppressed in the modern era. It did remain popular in Taiwan and Indonesia. And it's currently experiencing a resurgence in the Chinese mainland. The two popular sects are the Celestial Masters, which are referred to as Tian Shi. And uh, Tian Shi means the way of the Heavenly Masters. It's a hereditary system with parishes that offer spiritual guidance. And then the uh, other sect is known as Chuan Chen. It's the way of complete perfection. It's a monastic approach, blending Taoism and Confucianism with Buddhism. Um, so one of these systems emphasizes more uh, ancestral connections. The other emphasizes more a monastic uh, withdrawal approach. Buddhism's influence led to an explosion of sacred writings and belief in and the veneration of a pantheon of deities, which is somewhat ironic because, as you know, the
the uh, emphasis in uh, Shakyamuni Buddhism is to uh, rely on yourself and not emphasize the veneration of, of spirits and gods. Now let's take a few moments and look at the two divination systems for finding wisdom and for foretelling the future and uh, for making choices about life. The I Ching and uh, the Hexagram. The I Ching is a collection of practical wisdom pertaining to every conceivable situation. It originates in ancient China and is the oldest Chinese classical text. I Ching means classic of changes or the book of changes. Uh, sometimes you see that spelled with a capital I and then capital C-H-I-N-G. Other times you see it spelled as one word, Y-I-J-I-N-G, but it's the same thing. Uh, one is just a more modern rendering than the other. Anyway, in the I Ching, there are 64 different main kinds of situations. Uh, each one is indicated by a hexagram, which is a symbol made up of six lines. Each of these lines can be broken or unbroken. To obtain advice from the I Ching about one's current situation, one can consult it as an oracle, like the Oracle of Delphi in Classical Greece and Rome, who was actually a, uh, a fallen angel. Uh, or spirit working for one of the fallen angels, like uh, Apollo. But in this case, uh, the emphasis is upon the, uh, the Tao, or the flow, resident in the I Ching. The uh, idea is to use the hexagram as sort of a random approach to discerning the truth about something or to gain some kind of insight or uh, direction. The random hexagram is supposed to be not random at all, but it coincides with your situation. It simply is paradoxical and appears to be random, but then the pattern begins to emerge, which is the pattern of the Tao. Um, I would emphasize here that there there's, doesn't seem to be any scientific theory whatsoever that explains how this could happen. Um, I would also explain that there are modernists in the West who have become enamored with Taoism and have attempted through what I believe are, are uh, mathematical and philosophical acrobatics to attempt to make connections, for example, with some quantum mechanics theory and how the uh, hexagram and the I Ching work. Uh, nothing has ever been established in any kind of scientific way uh, that there's an actual connection among these things. Anyway, uh, the psychologist also, Carl Jung, studied the I Ching and named uh, this, what appeared to be the coinciding, uh, seemingly unrelated events as they come together and reveal a pattern, identified by Jung as synchronicity, a term you may have heard of. Sounds very scientific and Western, but really that's what it is, is how the I Ching, or the hexagram, uh, as one analyzes it, allows for a pattern to emerge, which is a guidance for the individual's lives. As I told you, the uh, hexagram is a set of six lines. It's not a star, it's a set of six lines, and the lines can be broken or unbroken. The broken lines are the yin, and the unbroken lines, the yang. Something is yin when it is female, dark, earthly, and passive, and yang when it is male or light, heavenly, active. So, you have these two elements in the hexagram that are embedded as central core parts of uh, that, this approach. The hexagram is a set of six lines, as I said, and there are 64 hexagrams that are indicated by a number that is all universal. All translations of the I Ching use the same numbers. So, uh, traditionally the I Ching is consulted by throwing 50 yarrow stalks, but usually a set of three coins is used. Coins are thrown six times while a question is held in the mind. 
It's also possible to just let the I Ching comment on your current state when no question is held. However, the I Ching will only comment on your current situation. It will not predict what will happen in the future, which, of course, is dependent on what you take from the I Ching and how you apply that. The hexagram is built from the bottom up, so the first line is the bottom one. The sixth line is the top one, so things ascend. They move upward. So to calculate the lines from the co coins thrown, values are assigned to the coin sides. Tails equals a value of 2, heads a value of 3. The values of the three coins are added to get the total to determine the line. So uh, you can have a variety of uh, outcomes in this way. Some of the kinds of questions you might ask are questions like, what will my love life look like over the next few months? What should I be doing in order to get my career on track? Or how should I be balancing my work and family commitments along with my need for fun and self-fulfillment? Those are the kind of things. Now remember, the I Ching is not predicting your future, but it's giving you insight into yourself to help you make decisions that will affect your future. Now I'd like to take a few moments to talk with you about uh, Chinese popular religion and the role of the immortals in uh, one's pursuing of the Tao. Chinese popular religion uh, is a blend of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism, of course, practiced by many people in Chinese communities around the world. And this, of course, is alongside the atheistic influence and the promotion of the state as God in communist China. Nevertheless, China is a, a vast area which has a lot of people that are not always directly under the thumb of the Chinese government and that uh, political propaganda machine. So there are still traditional things going on. Might add that also one of the largest movements in the world in terms of uh, conversion to Christianity is occurring in China right now in, in those kinds of regions. It's a very large underground movement, and there is a lot of uh, persecution going on in China of Christian churches that are not officially sanctioned by the state, and uh, the growth seems to be occurring, ironically, not uh, because of the promotion of the government and the state, but directly in spite of it in contrast with it. So it's an interesting time going on there. Anyway, uh, the synthesis of these faiths in China emphasizes beings called immortals and festivals that bring together the community uh, which are designed to promote the, the Tao but also to promote the veneration of these immortal beings. So there is a, a view of a hierarchy in heaven that, that you might want to understand. And uh, here's a little information about that. At the heart of Chinese popular religion are the many thousands of immortals who range from exalted but mysterious beings to familiar figures uh, whose images are seen in, in a lot of Chinese homes. They have little altars. Like if you know uh, Mexico, Latin America, they have a lot of times home altars where they venerate an ancestor or one of the saints. It's the same kind of idea. At the top of the hierarchy, though, is the Jade Emperor and his consort, the Empress. Then there are other court gods who act as servants and officials for the heavenly court. These heavenly bureaucrats parallel the uh, earthly civil service that existed in Imperial China. And the view was that the Chinese Emperor and his court were a manifestation or, or a uh, reflection of the heavenly court and the hierarchy in heaven. The Jade Emperor and many of the courtiers are really too far removed, they're too exalted and too high above mortals on earth to be directly experienced. So lesser messengers as deities act as intermediaries between devotees in heaven. This is quite similar to the idea of the enlightened, awakened Buddha and then the Bodhisattva 
uh, manifestations of the awakened Buddha who are accessible for humans to help them in their journey. Anyway, the most popular of these intermediaries are the kitchen god and his wife who help produce uh, an annual report of every person's deeds and they deliver it to the Jade Emperor who then passes judgment on how well a person has done. In a lot of Chinese homes, you will see portraits of the kitchen god and his consort displayed above the stove in the kitchen. At the end of the year, homeowners smear honey on the god's mouth to make his report, quote, sweet to them and full of good words. And then they take the print down from the wall and burn it in the stove as an offering, and the smoke of the fire is said to carry the god's report to the jade emperor in heaven. So, Chinese popular religion is also highly pragmatic, very practical. The devotees call upon the gods to help them when they face difficulties or have stress or confront some new challenge. Many deities exist and they have many different roles. There are gods who preside over health, others who uh, help people with their education, their studies, their examinations, or help in starting new business ventures. Um, still others who look after infants and new mothers. In addition, there are many deities who are popular because they play more general roles. For example, there are three gods of good fortune, uh, Fu Xing, Lu Xing, and Xu Xing, which are the gods of happiness, wealth, and longevity. Of course, Xu Xing is especially popular because long life is highly valued in Chinese culture, and you probably have known this about, about that value on age and long life and the wisdom of age, which is uh, traditional to Chinese culture. This comes through having a good balance, however, of the yin and the yang. And of course, this good balance in yin and yang is tied directly to uh, the ritual sex magic that I will, I'll tell you a little about when I get back to class. Devotees pray to all of these gods using smoke from burning incense to send their messages to heaven. Uh, they do this at popular religious temples publicly and in one temple could contain several altars, each with statues of, different, of a different deity which worshipers can make offerings to and appeal to for help and support. So uh, there are Chinese people that also have their favorite deities, which uh, become the focus for their individual lives as well. Uh, you've probably also heard of uh, Tai Chi, which has become very popular in the West. Well, Tai Chi is a Taoist uh, disciplinary practice that is designed to help the flow of vital energy or the, or the chi through the body and uh, through the ritual sex magic, this also can be released as powerful energy into uh, the higher planes of existence, into the immortality realm. Uh, now, concerning ethics, morality, and law, uh, Taoism is seen as a path that offers a way to live a very ethical life. It may seem passive to us here in the West because it's all about submitting to the flow of things and blending. Nevertheless, uh, Taoism has moral precepts that show people how they must respect others and how they must behave in order to live well. The path to goodness is an overriding ethical principle which I mentioned earlier called Wu Wei. And this concept is a concept of non-interference or going with the flow. Nature and the Tao show no favoritism. The followers of the Tao should show similar impartiality to others. Sages of Taoism encourage people to be detached from the world and to live in tune with nature, of course. In Taoism, the good should always be favored over the non-good. Adherents are taught to follow the Wu Wei to try to be supple or flexible in their responses to the world. 
also to be humble and to cultivate the feminine side. At the same time, Taoists should avoid vices such as cursing and bad language, insulting others, greed, uh, sexual immorality, theft, gossip, breaking your word, anger, and being hard-hearted. So, there are three ways that are ethical goals of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. Each of the three ways offers mutually compatible spiritual and ethical learning. So, uh, these three ways are very important if one is going to achieve a good and healthy life. The three ways are the virtues of respect for order, self-cultivation, and following a moral path. Religious observances may be formal in the sense that uh, at temple sites, uh, Taoism can be promoted for the individual through uh, offering sacrifices, so forth. But also religious observ observances can be very personal and individual, as in going into nature and meditating and uh, promoting a harmonious balance between oneself, one's life, one's own body and bodily functions and nature itself and its cycles. Uh, cycles of life are, of course, very important in Taoism because they correspond to the five phases of life that are central to Taoist belief. Um, many of these surround rites of passage like birth, uh, puberty, marriage, and... Uh, eventually, of course, death and last rites. Um, this is to the extent that, for example, at a wedding, there is a careful observance and correct physical placing of the guests in relationship to the groom's family, which is placed to the east, and this is the yang or masculine principle, and the bride's family to the west, which is the yin and the feminine principle. And this is, again, to create a balance, but eventually, as they come together in marriage, a uh, union of, of opposites to create a whole. Uh, last rites are carried out when a person dies, and, and these rites are just as carefully considered. Mourners express the relationship of yin and yang again by adopting preordained positions. Men are to the east, women to the west, the masculine and the feminine balance as well as the correct orientation of the deceased body with the head toward the south. At the deceased's home, the family altar is covered with white cloths. White is the color of yin, or the feminine, and it's a symbol of mourning. Mourners may also burn money and symbolic paper artifacts to ease the soul's journey heavenward. So, uh, Sometimes the mourners also go into subterranean uh, ritual chambers and present sacrifices uh, that are designed to ensure that the soul passes as quickly as possible through the afterlife process of judgment from the Jade Emperor. Festivals in Taoism in China uh, involve many different kinds of celebrations. But one specifically Taoist festival is called Jiao, and it's a ceremony that takes place near the winter solstice. That's December 20, 20th, 21st. And it marks the renewal of the heavenly masculine yang uh, at this point in the calendar. Remember, the yang is a, an active, powerful force for generation and for control and restraint as well. The ceremony is celebrated by Taoist priests who have undergone purification rituals and wear lavish uh, vestments, costumes. The overall Jiao Fe festival is commemorated with notable music and dancing and giant effigies of the gods. These are intended to frighten away evil spirits. Uh, there are other Chinese calendar events as well that, that are celebrated and important. For example, the uh, New Year Festival, which is a time of house cleaning and settling of old debts. 
to start a new beginning, a fresh a new beginning. This is uh, another celebration of the, renew the renewal of Yang. Decorations are usually in Yang colors, which are colors such as red, orange, and gold, very bright, vibrant. The New Year is followed by the Lantern Festival and its many offerings to the various gods, and also by Qingming, a time to remember the dead and celebrate the coming of spring. And you can begin to see how these festivals line up with the five phases of uh, life in the Tao. There's a Midsummer Festival, the Double Fifth, that marks the peak of Yang as a force and aims to protect people from too much Yang by the use of five, quote, poisons. Centipede, scorpion, snake, toad, lizard. Now that may be a little off-putting to you, but the belief is the yang cannot be out of control. Remember, everything has to be in a balance. So, these are seen in designs on clothing and on amulets that are worn. Five colors that are represented are blue, red, yellow, white, and black. Then we have the Feast of the Hungry Ghosts. And this marks the time when the gates of hell are said to open, letting out malevolent spirits. Priests hold ceremonies to encourage the spirits to repent and return back to hell. Now that's a little bit like what I've talked to you before in the Near East, in Mesopotamia and Persia, about the uh, uh, feasts that were done to open the portals of the underworld and bring the spirits forth. But of course in this view, the spirits were not seen necessarily as malevolent, but can be viewed as very powerful, benevolent forces that could be controlled and also could be protective forces on the for the practitioners. So that's a little different. But it's interesting the parallels that the concepts are, are very much the same, and the view of the spiritual entities is very much the same. Okay, I hope uh, I was able to get this done in a little under an hour, which is what I was hoping to do. I hope this will be meaningful to you, that you'll find some things here that were interesting and also uh, maybe uh, enjoyable for you to learn about. And uh, I hope that the visuals provided in this uh, lecture also will be an enrichment and enhancement for you as, as we move forward. Uh, we will be looking at Confucianism in our next uh, lecture, and then we'll follow that with Shintoism and then sum up how the Eastern religions all sort of fit together and, and uh, complement, but then also sometimes contrast with one another. Hope you have a wonderful day. I look forward to seeing you next class.